Welcome back, Robin. yards. Turn left. at your destination. Done much rallying? That's a joke. We've all seen what you've been up to. We're doing the next bit on location. You'll see why when you get there.
yards, you will arrive at your destination. Ford, that most American of cars. But the Ford Escort, oh, that's British. And more than that, the Escort would become for many synonymous with Group B. In the 70s, Ford had embraced that destiny so firmly that they'd begun their own championships to find new drivers. Drivers for cars like the RS1800. This was a car designed explicitly for rallying, with a powerful fuel-injected 1790cc Cosworth BDE engine. Homologation rules required that all cars entered into the group be production, so Ford built 200 of them. The RS-1800 raced to victory after victory across the rallying world on almost every continent and across every terrain type imaginable. This car was basically unbeatable. The RS-1800 brought home 17 World Rally Championship victories for Ford. So, of course, Ford set out to design a better one. The RS200 Evolution was their answer. A purpose-built rally car designed to do one thing, win Group B. With a 1.8 turbocharged Ford Cosworth BDT engine and all-wheel drive, the RS200 had perhaps the best suspension platform of any car of its era. The chassis was fiberglass from Reliance, and the massive Ford parts bin was raided to give the car that iconic look. But while the car had potential, turbo lag at low RPM and a poor power-to-weight ratio meant that it never placed better than third. The end of Group B in the mid-80s meant the end of the RS200 as a rallying car. Fortunately, Ford built over 200 as part of the homologation requirements for Group B, so you can still find them, if you're lucky. You know, I really like this car. Not that I'd want to drive it for too long. Squeeze yourself in there and let's see just how fast you can make it go. Which won't be too fast. But hey, I could be surprised. The pe
has the dubious honour of being the smallest production car in the world. A one-door microcar coupe. Featuring a 42cc air-cooled engine, capable of a heinous 38 miles an hour. And a handle, so you can pick it up and carry it with you when you get to work. And keep in mind that this is the production version. The prototype had the single wheel at the front. Why would you think that was a good idea? Dear. In 2010, though, production restarted at Sutton in Ashfield. So, if you'd like to own the modern incarnation of this, I suppose you can. Hey there! How about a car with some actual legroom and some actual speed? This section's about what happened when McLaren decided to make a road car. You're going to enjoy this. The track and the road have very different requirements. For McLaren, that was a challenge they were more than willing to embrace. In 1988, they set out to create the finest sports car the world has ever seen. By 1993, they had achieved their goal, and the honestly fantastic F1 was the result. 106 would be built across all variants, and it remains one of the very best road cars. Cars ever made. The F1 has no turbocharger. That would have compromised the driving experience, increased complexity and resulted in turbo lag. The F1 is a naturally aspirated supercar, one of the fastest in the world, in fact. Everything about this car is innovative, from the carbon fiber monocoque to the central driver position. McLaren threw the book away when they designed the F1, then they wrote a better one. The F1 monocoque chassis is incredibly lightweight, only 100 kilos all told, which posed a significant challenge because carbon fiber and fiberglass aren't great insulators. So McLaren lined the entire engine compartment with gold. In 1998, the F1 prototype set the world record for fastest production car, a record that would stand for two decades until the Koenigsegg CCR claimed the crown. McLaren's racing heritage is so deeply ingrained in this machine that they took it to Le Mans in 1995 and faced off against purpose-built racing machines and won. So, with something like the F1 to live up to, where do you go next? Well, you throw the book away again and write an even better one. The result is the McLaren P1, a hybrid electric sports car that stands head and shoulders above the F1. The P1 GTR will hit 60 miles an hour in 2.4 seconds. That's 0.7 seconds faster than the F1. That's an eternity for a supercar.
the car's blistering performance is delivered by a twin-turbo V8, supplemented by a McLaren ECU electric motor and instant power assist system. And they do mean instant. Remember those problems with turbo lag? McLaren solved that with the hybrid drive. While the turbos build pressure, the electric motor drives the wheels. No turbo lag, just torque. And because it's a hybrid, it has an all-electric range. Running on batteries alone, that's 6.2 miles. A bit more if you're going downhill. I quite like sleeper cars. Did Alex ever tell you the story of what we got up to in Colorado? There was this sleeper car competition, you see. Let's just say no one was ready for the sunbeam. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tyres were widened and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-levelling suspension from the Opel Senator.
has never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own... Cars. They upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tyres were widened and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. A 177 miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four-door saloon. Only 950 of these custom gems were built, and they've become something of a modern classic. The Lotus Carlton was an example of how to turn a saloon into a supercar. But that's not the only thing Lotus got up to. In 1979, Chrysler approached Lotus to create a strict rally version of their Sunbeam three-door hatchback. Lotus, as you might imagine, rather enjoyed the challenge. They took the rear-wheel drive hatchback and changed everything that matters. They stiffened the suspension, improved the anti-roll bars and widened the transmission tunnel. Performance was increased by fitting a 2.2-litre version of the Lotus 911 slant four-cylinder engine, resulting in an impressive 250 brake horsepower, up from Amiga 105 on the original. The Lotus Sunbeam was revealed to the public in 1979 in Geneva to widespread praise in the motoring media. the Lotus Sunbeam saw racing success too. In 1980, Henri Toivonen won the 29th Lombard RAC Rally in his Sunbeam. makes 
you wonder if Lotus should do more conversions. It's a silly question, actually. Lotus should do more conversions. In fact, I'll call them right now.